It starts out as a series called Lost, Stolen, or Shredded on Radio 4 a few years ago. I can never remember exactly when. It might be 2009, 2010. No, I thought I would leave it at that because it seems to me that transferring a radio series into a book can be a complicated thing, and I had done it once before already. So I thought, that's the end of it, never again, and the next thing I knew I was doing it. And why did you end up doing it? Was it a hungry publisher, or was it actually you wanted to get this all together? And... I think there was eventually a good reason. Is My book after that was a book called Outside of a Dog. And that's a kind of memoir of my life as a reader, but it was also quite an intimate story of my marriage, my relationship to my wife and my ex-wife. And it was personal. It was a very difficult book to write. Very difficult book to write. And the book next down the line was a long and complicated history of the book, from cave art to Kindles, which is a very daunting prospect. So I thought, in between the two, I'll go back to Lost, Stolen, or Shredded and make it into a book, and that'll give me some respite. And that was a terrific idea, except it wasn't true. Because nothing gives a writer respite. No, exactly. All that happens when you write is that you suffer a lot. I thought, it can't be that hard to take a 1,300-word radio script and make it into a 5,000-word chapter, and I assure you it is. And a lot of writers say... I publish my book, it goes out into the world, it has its own life, I move on, I don't care what reviews it gets, which is almost always disingenuous. Right. The book goes out, there's a very complex set of figurations about to what extent you're still attached to it, and, and even to what extent it's still attached to you. And I think authors don't let go of their books, but they gradually sort of unravel from them, that the kinds of filaments and feelings that tie you to a work of your own just over time dissolve. So I knew this book, which is an eccentric book and a curiously kind of personal book, even though it's about lost works of art, would get some people saying, it's narcissistic, it's this, it's that. You shouldn't do that kind of thing. The methodology is peculiar. And actually, nobody did, and I was disappointed. <laughs> it's kind of quite hoping somebody would have a go. <laughs> That's a shame. Maybe yeah, well, stir something up now. Well, I'm doing I'm doing a gig tonight with Erica Wagner, who's very smart and nice. And she said to me, "What question shall I ask you?" And I said, "I'm bored of self-congratulatory interviews at literary festivals. Think of the hardest questions you can." And she said, "Okay." And I said, and don't tell them to me in advance. So I'm looking forward to it a lot. James Joyce, as a very young child, nine years old, writes a poem about Parnell and the death of Parnell. And the poem comes to be known as Et Tu Healy. And his father is so proud of his precocious little brat kid who can write a poem that he goes down to the printers and he prints 30 or 40 copies of what we call a broadside. A broadside is one page printed like that. And it's clear, A, that it was printed, they did exist, Joyce's brother Stanislaus remembered seeing it, and indeed could quote some lines from it. Only no copy has survived. And I, both as a Joycean, like you, I'm, I'm besotted by Joyce, and as a rare book dealer, and as a person who's interested in things that are lost, I think it would be absolutely riveting to find the only known copy of Et to Healy. It'd also be valuable. It's probably worth half a million pounds, maybe a million pounds. Built into this is the paradox that once you found it, it would be disappointing. Not merely because it wasn't lost anymore, because it's only a scrap of paper with a poem by a nine-year-old on it. And Et to Healy is only numinous and fascinating and desirable in so far as it doesn't exist. And so I end up by feeling I hope nobody finds it, unless it's me. When the Mona Lisa was stolen in August of 1911, the Louvre was closed for a week while they dusted for fingerprints and looked under the sculptures to see if it was there. When it opened a week later, there was a gigantic queue of people 
larger than the queue of people who used to go and see the Mona Lisa, who went to see where it wasn't. And they all went in and they stared at this blank space. And it's always fascinated me to ask the question, which is a very complicated question, I think, what were they looking at or for? It also has a kind of spooky resonance for the people who go to that little tunnel in Paris to see where Princess Diana died. And when they look in there, it's only an underpass. It's the most unprepossessing you can drive through it. It's nothing. But everybody's fascinated by it. I think the role of the writer in the digital age is, is a really interesting question. First of all, when we delete things, they don't get deleted, as Edward Snowden probably could have pointed out. But in any case, every keystroke on a computer is recoverable. One of the things that's going to go missing is books codexes, bound bits of paper, because every commentator who has asked what is the future of the book says, who knows, what am I supposed to do, predict the future? I know there aren't going to be as many books. There is no question about it, whether that takes 20 years or 50 years or 200 years. The paradigm has changed, just as it changed when Gutenberg came in with the Gutenberg Bible, printing, everybody said, these printed things are a lot better than illuminated manuscripts. The paradigm is broken. They offer benefits of a kind that the previous incarnation didn't. That seems to me absolutely clear about the electronic book. My Kindle is a better object in a variety of ways than carrying around a whole bunch of printed books. In some ways, it's a less good object, and so the printed book will continue to survive and to attenuate and to go into disuetude over a period of time. Um, but, you know, my great-great-great-great-grandchildren will have to pay this, but I'll happily bet you a pound that in a hundred years there aren't going to be many books. Kindles are very crude incarnations of a new set of possibilities. iPads are better ones. Um, that will happen in time. But if you can simply imagine as it gets more sophisticated how much easier it will be, you cut, you paste, you do. When you're dealing with books, it's a pain in the neck, right? You have to take the book, you have to write it all down or type it in, all that. The new way, you cut and paste it, you take it, you put it there, you put it there. Next thing you know, you've probably forgotten to make a note of where it came from and all of that. But <coughs> things are going to change, yeah.